copy is just writing with a purpose for business. So the purpose of your writing when it's copy is to compel someone to take action, to go from one step to the next. So you have to be really mindful of where the person's psychology is when they encounter that writing and what your ultimate goal is for them to take action to go from step A to step B when you're composing your copy to make sure it's really compelling. Do you want to earn more, work less and enjoy what you do each day? It's no secret, it can be done. This podcast with Dr. T will not only educate and inspire you, it will also teach you how to do more and be more with the time you already have. It will be like a shot of adrenaline straight into the heart of your business. Here is your host, Tyson Franklin. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin and welcome to this week's episode of It's No Secret with Dr. T. This podcast is brought to you by me and my book, It's No Secret, There's Money in Small Business. Now, my guest today is really tall. And she has a maths and she was a maths and psychology teacher turned international bestseller. She's an author, international speaker, podcaster, and persuasive writing expert. She helps people to actually make money with their books, build the brand authority, and grow the business. Today, put your ears together and welcome Laura Peterson. Laura, how are you doing? I'm good, and I love that intro. Nice job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked up a few things when when we met at Podcast Movement yeah. in Philadelphia, and what was really cool is I listened to what a lot of other people were talking about uh, at that event. One, I, I, your talk was on psychology and persuasiveness, mm. and I've taken some of that and I'm now using it, which is fantastic. Love it. And there was another guy, Super Joe Pardo, and I was on his podcast. He did an interview with me while we were there. And his introduction was, this show is brought to you by me. And he was promoting something that he did. And I went, what a brilliant idea. That's so true. And I mean, like I, for my show, I don't have sponsors. I just, you know, share my own products and services. But it's true, like a lot of time and money goes into making the show. Yeah. So we really are giving a gift to the audience. And it doesn't hurt to say, hey, I'm bringing you this show today. (laughs) Yeah. So um, when I heard Joe do that, I went, wow, I'm going to do that myself because this show is brought to you by me and my guests and all the knowledge that my guests will share which is why i'll have links well, actually let's how can people connect with you let's get that in early sure so yeah my hub is copy that pops.com so that's copy as in writing not coffee although <laughs> <laughs> i i think maybe a future brand will be coffee that pops because i love coffee too <laughs> who doesn't but yeah copy that pops.com is a nice central hub and I'm Laptop Laura on all the social media channels. Laptop Laura. I like that, I yeah. like that name. <laughs> yeah. Well, because Laura Peterson, my name was already taken. And I want. I love stuff with alliteration. I just always love things that kind of start with the same letter or have similar sounds. It just is kind of like a fun hook. So Laptop Laura, I always have my laptop with me no matter where I am in the world. And it just really fits. No, I think it's good. And I think in social media, I've had a few guests in there. They'll have their Instagram accounts, one name, their LinkedIn accounts, a different name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every social media platform is different. And I was talking to Adam Franklin, who was a past guest. And I told him, I said, all mine just says Tyson Frank, Tyson Franklin 66. Okay, it's just the easiest way uh-huh. to keep everything. Set. Plus, it helps me remember my birthday, which is in 1966. <laughs> when I get older... <laughs> It might be the only thing I actually remember is my social media handles. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. It's smart to use something that you can definitely get on any platform no matter what happens. So let's get stuck into this. Let's get stuck in. Psychology and maths, is that a normal thing that people put together (laughs) to do teaching? I know there's people that are maths teachers. I know people are psychologists. But to put the two together? Uh, No, I think that's pretty unique. I'm not sure if I've met anyone else who has done that. And I actually... I was originally thinking about being an English teacher, which makes sense with what I'm doing now. That wouldn't be a shock to anybody. Uh, But I I started as an English major in undergrad, and they kind of sucked the fun out of it because it was just so much reading and writing. It was kind of like, wait, I like to actually enjoy, you know, this – these literary works. And I ended up taking more psychology classes, fell head over heels in love with psychology, changed my major to that. I did a minor in German and studied abroad in Germany for a year. And 
uh, you know, my life took some a couple of twists and turns and trying different things, but I ended up running back to what I knew, which is education for a while and became a high school teacher. And I did my degree in secondary education. And then when you're going to teach high school, you can pick what you want to specialize in. Yeah. And I really thought about English, but then I thought, well, I'm not sure if I want to be grading a bunch of teenagers essays all weekend long. <laughs> and I thought, well, I always loved math too. I'm a big nerd for math. Yeah. That would be something more fun to, for the grading and the paperwork type of stuff. And also it's super in demand. It's really my true passion would be just to teach psychology, but I thought starting out, not a lot of schools take psychology or have that as an offering. So math was a good in demand subject. So I started with math my first year. I only had math classes. And then when more psych classes opened up, I was able to take on some psychology too. So that's kind of the weird combination of story of how that came to me. <laughs> because some people would have to say you have to be nuts to be a maths teacher as well. So yeah, do, yeah. having the psychology degree behind you, you actually fix your own problems. Yeah. <laughs> and so how, how long did you do teaching for? So it was five years in total, uh, at least in a physical classroom, if you count student teaching. And then when I took the leap after five years of teaching full time, I was still teaching psychology online for a community college for another five or six years. And that was kind of what helped me pay some of the basic bills as I got my businesses up and running, which was really nice. Okay. So copy that pops and that's all about writing. How did you go from the transition from being a, a teacher who was probably employed by the government or maybe a private right. school or a university? Right. How did you make that switch from going from that to deciding to do copy that pops, which is back into writing? Yeah, my story is is not super linear. <laughs> I actually wanted to be an entrepreneur at the age of 21 when my dad gave me the book Rich Dad Poor Dad right when I got back from studying abroad in Germany. That is a good book, yeah. Yeah, that was my that was a pivotal time in my life. So I had just traveled all over Europe and saw more of the world. You know, I'd grown up in Southern California, which was amazing, but I was in a kind of a bubble, and that's what I thought all that there was to the world. And once I lived abroad in Europe and just backpacked all over, I was like, whoa, there's more to life than just academics. I want, I learned to dance salsa and I did art and I did a trampoline competition. I did all <laughs> these, I know I did all these really amazing things over there, studied foreign languages, obviously, and backpacked everywhere with friends. And when I got back, I had one more year of college. I was, my major was psychology, but I was sort of disenchanted with the world. I was kind of like, I feel like all I want to do is travel and explore other cultures, but now I'm kind of stuck back in my climbing the academic ladder world. And my dad gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which just further changed my whole perspective. Cause before I thought the only way for success was to get a good job or to yeah. become a PhD in an academic setting. And reading that book, I was like, Oh, you can actually create businesses and invest in real estate. There's all these other ways to to create and build wealth that I didn't realize up until then. So at 21 is really when I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I tried different things, couldn't figure it out, ran back to what I knew, which is education, did my master's and taught. And then when I was turning 30, my fifth year of teaching, I was just like, you know what, it's time to just burn the bridges and make the jump. So my first company that I started was a tutoring and test prep company which is a really natural progression from being a teacher to doing um, tutoring. And I wasn't doing the tutoring so much. We were hiring people to be the tutors, but it was a really easy bridge from that to that. Yeah. And that company's still alive and well, but I'm not involved in it anymore just because my heart got really more into digital marketing. So kind of the bridge to bring us to copy the pops is I, I started doing digital marketing, social media work for other clients and companies and businesses, started a podcast production company with a friend of mine. And so I was helping launch other people's podcasts and do the content marketing strategy behind that. And I was like, you know what? I need to start my own show and my own brand to grow while I'm also working on other people's stuff. And that's how copy that pops was formed in 2016. So when I first started my own show, I was actually making money by doing podcast production. Oh, right. Okay. So I, I didn't realize that. I didn't know that you were doing yeah. podcast production. Are you still doing podcast production? Or No. No, you're out of that no, now as well? No, because of the book stuff. So that that's like when all things change was around the books. And I know you might even have a, you mentioned to me at one point like, well, 
why did you write books about podcasting yeah. if that's not what you do anymore? But that's why. So I started my show in April of 2016, Copy the Paps, and it was all about applying psychology and improving our writing in all the different ways for business. So that could be social media posts or Facebook ads or landing pages, your bios, blogs, all that kind of stuff. And then at the end of that year in 2016, I had three people I really respected all say, where's your book? Like you can write in your sleep. This is like obviously something that's a, a zone of genius for you. Why yeah. don't you have a book? You know, you can really stand out from the competition by having a book. And I was like, oh, I didn't really think of that. Okay, let me do it. So I wrote and self-published hit bestseller in the category podcasts and webcasts with my first book. I did this all in 30 days at the end of 2016. Oh, nice. And that's why it's all about my first book is called copywriting for podcasters because it's like the perfect overlap of writing and what I was doing at the time, podcast production. Oh, you've got it right there in I've your hand. I've got it here. Yes. I've got it here in my hand. Yes, you gave it to me. You gave me a copy at, uh, at Podcast Movement. So I have gone through part of it. Um, oh, I love that. Which, which I thought, that's why I was asking the question that you were so yeah. much into writing. I yeah. was wondering why the two books that you've written were directed toward yeah. podcasting and not other things. But is it because you've written in an area that you've niched down into something instead of yes. being very broad? Yes. You, you've, See, that, you've picked an area. That, yeah, you're hitting on the other part of it too. So I really believe that the most effective thing you can write about is a topic that's going to help you sell more of the products and services that you want to be known for and get you more speaking gigs talking about things that can lead you to sell more products yeah. and services that you already have. So I really work with people to say, okay, yes, you could write your life's memoir. Yes, you could you know, write something very broad about like leadership in general. But if you're not selling stuff around leadership services or products, I would say, well, let's pick something that's going to naturally lead to more speaking engagements, more podcast interviews and more sales around something that you already are growing in your business. Yeah, that makes sense. And because like I've written two books and this is the funny part. The first book yeah. I wrote was It's No Secret There's Money in Podiatry. Uh -huh. and, and the funny part with that book was a lot of people would not read that book because it had the word podiatry in it. They go, oh. oh, yeah, but I'm not a podiatrist, so I wouldn't read it. Anyone who right. read the book would go, wow, you could just take the word podiatry out, put any business name in there, and it would apply. And I went, yeah, pretty much. So then I wrote the <laughs> second book, It's No Secret, There's Money in Small Business. It's a better book than the first book, but my first book still sells five times more than my second book. Yeah, yeah. Because it's niched down in one particular area. But my second book is the one that I, if I'm talking to people, I give away because it's more of a, it's a broad spectrum type book. Mm -hmm. But my next book is going to be niche back down again. I love it. Yeah. And that's another thing too that you're hitting on is you don't have to stop at one book. Oh, so no. I've got don't multiple feel like you. Yeah, I know, right? And because I mean, I think sometimes people get intimidated by writing a book too, because they feel like it needs to be their life's work summarized in one manuscript. And it's like, no, 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 you've got tons of books in you. Just pick a topic that's going to actually give value to somebody who's a few steps behind you and whatever that you know, you're specialized in. And there you go. And then you can do the next one. So you actually help people write books now or you help people make money after they've written the book? I do both. You do both? Because it, yeah, like, there's so, so many people out there now teaching people how to write books. I mean, right. you get on the internet, there's tons of them. You, yeah. Every area, there's a, you know, a past author who had some success in the past and now they, they, they might be a bit of a hacker now. They're teaching people how to write books, but yeah. they're so I, some of them are out of touch with what's going on, but you actually teach people mm. how to make money. Yes, yes, for sure. So in 2017, like right after I did my book, which came out in November of 2016, all of a sudden people were just reaching out to me like crazy saying, how did you do it? I watched your whole journey. And actually one of the things that I talk about and teach with my clients is to use what I call attraction based marketing tactics, applying that psychology too. Yeah. So instead of just pushing, 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 look at me, look at my book. Once it's live, you know, like go into a cave, write the book, come out and just like try to shove it down people's throats. I really teach and encourage people to share the book writing journey and involve your audience in it. So do things like have people vote on the cover and give you feedback or have people give you advice on tweaking the title and the subtitle. It's actually amazing the the great help you'll get for free from everybody. Yeah. But then psychologically, they're involved in your process and they're going to be more likely to support you and buy your book when you go live with a bestseller launch. 
and really understand what you're all about and be more likely to hire you for your products and services or recommend you and refer you out. So at the end of 2016 and into 2017, I had so many people reaching out saying, oh my gosh, I want to do what you did too, that I was like, whoa, this is a bigger demand even than podcast production. Yeah. And it's a skill in what I'm doing that you can't outsource out of the country for three to five dollars an hour, which people could do for <laughs> podcast production. So True. that was that was feeling like a harder business sale to really earn what I was worth in terms of just business models. So when I saw so many people wanting help with writing and self publishing and figuring out how to integrate it into their business, like I had, I was like, whoa, this is such a great business I hadn't even considered. And so. I ended up helping. What I did is I helped people for free first. And I said, can I just record it in exchange? Can I just record it? And you know, you make me a video testimonial if you're happy. And they said, absolutely. Yeah. So I put those recordings into a membership. I did video tutorials, like, you know, playing on my history of teaching experience and did video tutorials, breaking it all down. So what I have is an, I have an implementation program. If people just want to bang out a best selling book and they're like, you know, I just want to get the book and move on. Like, I don't need you to help me leverage it beyond. I've got that. Yeah. And then for people who do are like, okay, I either have a book already or I still need to get one done. But then I really want to be a part of an interactive community. I want to work with you directly, Laura, to get more podcast interviews. Cause I know you're like a nerd and super connected in podcasting. <laughs> we even met at podcast movement, right? Yeah. And I want to figure out how to position myself to speak on more stages and get over maybe a fear of public speaking and get out there. And I just want to get more media attention, get more opportunities, figure out how to use this book to really position myself and attract more leads and traffic and, and conversions. Then I have that too. And that's what I really love doing beyond just knocking out a book, but also really making sure we leverage it. Okay. And there's a lot of, a lot of this information or what you do is on your website, copy that pop. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then I have a free Facebook group too, if that's okay to shout yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it a shout out. Yeah, if people go to copythatpops.com forward slash Facebook, that's a short little URL that will redirect you over to the group in Facebook. It's a little easier than searching for it. But that is a free group, a free community. I'm active in there all the time. And it's for people who want to write, self-publish, launch, and leverage their books. And it's just a really supportive community that's growing. And then if you wanted more help and more in-depth stuff, then you can absolutely, you know, talk with me and reach out and we can have a conversation and see if it's a right fit for what else I have for no, offering. No, I reckon that sounds great. And you also have, uh, was it, you have a new, an ultimate checklist for people that yeah. they can get from your website as well. What was that all about? Yes. So if you go to copythepops.com forward slash book checklist that will take you right there too but also there are links to it on my website sorry my little earbuds just fell out i don't know if any of you heard <laughs> no, that right. i was like ah! um but yeah that is literally it's a google spreadsheet i'm like a big nerd for google everything yeah. so it's something that is literally you can go all the way down check it off check 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 and it's a detailed checklist showing you the step by step by step to go from no idea to awesome outline how to break it out in what order you should then write your book and then there are more resources at the bottom too beyond just writing the book if you want more help um, that are free or also part of my other programs and stuff but I've got like that's a great place to start if you're like okay I just want like a really good bird's eye view and something I could actually print out and use or use in the Google Docs um, platform and just check it off one by one to get through it. That's awesome. I'm gonna. I'll download that myself. Um, oh yeah. Even though, and that's the thing. Even though I've written two books, I'm always open to yeah. other ways of writing books, or writing books better, or better ways of promoting the book. So I think anyone that's listening to this, if you've written a book in the past, still go and get the checklist. If you haven't yeah. written a book and you you always think, I reckon I've got one in me, then download the checklist. The other oh, yeah. thing I was going to ask you about yeah. was when you're teaching people to be a better writer, it's not just mm -hmm. about writing books. It's about Everything that you write, copy is so important to right. um, if people are writing web articles, frequently asked questions. If they're just mm -hmm. writing for the local newspaper, the copy is so important. So important, yeah. And that's really the, the heart of my podcast, Copy That Pops, has covered all like a gamut of the types of writing that we do in business, 
more recently, I'm really obsessed with books. So more of the podcast uh, episodes recently are more focused around books, but really the lessons that we talk about can often be applied to anything. Yeah. And I do have episodes that are more honed in for like landing pages or, or different little topics. But yeah, copy, I would just describe if you're not 100% sure, copy is just writing with a purpose for business. So the purpose of your writing when it's copy is to compel someone to take action to go from one step to the next. So you have to be really mindful of where the person's psychology is when they encounter that writing and what your ultimate goal is for them to take action to go from step A to step B when you're composing your copy to make sure it's really compelling. Okay, so what, can you give me an example of some bad copy compared to good mm. copy when they're trying to get sure. the same result? That would be really helpful. Sure. Okay. So the first two things that jumped to my mind when you asked me that is number one, I like reading, but I have zero interest in reading long blobs of text. Okay. So we all, and this is not just me, but we all are inundated with information every day. We can agree on that, right? Constantly. <laughs> Right. And so when we encounter some writing, even if we want to read it, if we're interested in the topic, if it's just a giant blob of text, we just start feeling resistance and our eyes start going cross-eyed and we're like, eh, let me go watch this cat video instead. Because Is that like, it, like really just, long paragraphs? Is it? Are we talking yeah. social media or are we talking about like even in a book? Everywhere. everywhere. I say everywhere. Okay. That, and that's quite interesting that you say that is because when yeah. I was taught to write but, and I was mm -hmm. given some instructions mm -hmm. to write my book, when I first, my first draft of my book, everything was very short paragraphs. And then I was told, oh, no, you've got to make the paragraphs longer. Yeah. And now that's a lot the of the books thing. that I look at, the exact opposite. Everything is short paragraphs, a lot of space. And when I'm reading them, I prefer it that way because it gives mm -hmm. me the ability to be able to write notes in and yeah. ideas that pop into my head from those short paragraphs. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was such an academic nerd that I think it took me a couple years to unlearn some of that conditioning that you also experienced of like a paragraph must be four to six sentences minimum. And, you know, I think the academic writing is also let me cram in as many big words and fluff to make it seem like I know what I'm talking about and go yeah. on and on and on. But really, when it comes to being compelling for business, you need to get to the point. Less is more. Give that white space. Give that space to let the words breathe so that people can scan. We are scanning readers more so than just sit down and slog through giant blob readers at this point. Okay. So I also love bullets. So if you're going to say, I do the following four things, please don't write it in a long sentence that turns into, the, you know, looks like a giant blob. Just say, I do the following things, colon, bullet one, bullet two, bullet three. And then I can scan it and it makes me feel like I'm not reading so much, but I'm still getting the same information processed through my head faster. Okay. So that was the first thing is shorter paragraphs yeah. and bullets. What was, what was the second thing? The second thing is, I think a lot of us also back from this academic training are, sort of trained to write in a way to show off what we know and try to prove ourselves in our writing. But really when other people are reading, they care about their needs and yeah. their wants and their time and their desires. So you need to reframe it and think to write right away, what is the person going to get out of finishing reading that or out of taking the action to the next step? So you need to be really cognizant of getting right to the point of what the reader really cares about and not so much about the minutia or things talking about yourself okay. to kind of overprove yourself. Just get to the point of what the reader wants. So do you feel some authors or not just an author of a book, but uh, someone who's Looking writing up. a magazine? Oh, I must admit when I read some magazine articles and um, by the time I get to the second paragraph, I am bored shitless. Yes. I'm reading yes. it going, can you just get, you just told me that you, you're doing a, an article about Hawaii. Just tell me about Hawaii. Tell me why right. I want to go there. And I read mm -hmm. through it and the whole first two paragraphs are about the wind blowing through their hair and the, <laughs> the shirt they were wearing and what they were feeling at the time. And I'm like, I've already switched off. Yet they constantly mm. write that way. Why do they keep doing it? Is that old school? Yeah. Maybe, you know, I feel like there is some validity to trying to paint a visual picture yeah. and loop someone into a story. But 
if it takes too long, it's like, okay, are we still talking about this? It's like maybe just the first line or two to hook somebody. Yeah. Um, and actually something that we talked about uh, right before we hit record, which ties into the presentation I gave at Podcast Movement, was to incorporate a little bit of mystery. Yes. So I think that's a great tactic that we could you know, talk about now. And you even started applying it, which I love. Yeah, is, I did incorporate a little mystery into everything that you do. Now, if your number one goal is to get someone to click from A to B, maybe mystery there isn't necessarily the number one approach, uh, just kind of depending. Maybe you need to be a little bit more literal. But if you're writing a social media post or an email marketing newsletter to somebody, think about how you can leave a little bit to mystery to pull somebody into what you're writing. And I don't know if you want to share your example. Oh, no, no, I will. When, when we are at Podcast Movement, you were talking about um, just engaging with people on social media. And you gave one example of a particular mm-hmm. ad that you put up there. And you gave all the details and, and, and what it was about and it might have been who was speaking. Right. And you got like five engagements. Five people liked it and two or three no comments. No comments. Yeah. Then, yeah. So you, you took the same information, but instead you put a big question mark there. You didn't say who it was. All you did was give some dot points about the person. And I mm-hmm. think off the top of my head, maybe it was like 80 engagements. It was like, it was yeah, 10, 15, 20 times more engagement yeah. with those posts by not yeah. telling me exactly who it was. So I started applying that myself. And so when I do my introducing my next guest who used to say oh my guest next week is laura peterson rah, 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 and i'd go through <laughs> so now i go oh my my guest next week is i'm not going to tell you but here's a little snippet they hear yeah. the snippet and i go and hey from that you've figured out she is female she's from america and uh, she has a high level of energy and that's where i'll leave it <laughs> so yeah therefore that's all i'm posting out there and a few dot points about what you've done and mm-hmm. and I know that more people already are starting to go, hmm, who is next week's guest? So it yeah. does, it, it makes things a little bit more exciting. It involves the reader. Now when they read that and they see that, they have this gap in their understanding, they have this gap in their knowledge, and they start feeling this desire to fill in the gap. And then they start trying to guess like, oh, is that my friend Jen? Yeah. Or, oh, you know, or did I have that person on the show? Maybe I want to. So it starts to make them see themselves in the information and be involved in trying to fill in the missing bits in their mind. So yeah, that is such a powerful technique. I love it. Yeah, and when I do it with yours, you'll with this particular episode, you'll probably yeah. listen to it and go, is that me? Is that me? Talk- Hang Uh-oh. on, is that me? I wonder if that was me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, so what other tips do you give people when, um, so you went through those main two, and then you mentioned about mm. you know, creating a little bit of mystery. So when, mm-hmm. when people are writing the, a couple more things that they should just think about, yeah, you just said dot points as well, which is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, numbers, yeah, numbering things. I do love numbers. I'm a big fan of like listicles for articles or even email subject lines. You know, some people might say that kind of overused, but I think they are because they work. I know I love reading things when it says like three best ways to X, Y, Z. But then just make sure you actually deliver on that. So yeah. if I open up the article or open up the email, even if you have three things, but you don't label them as one, two, three, I feel disappointed and confused because I'm True. like, are those the three things or is it over here? Where You know what I mean? So I would say if you're going to do like a listicle, make sure you deliver on it. But I think that those are amazing. Conventional wisdom is to use odd numbers yeah. and uh, a rule of thumb psychologically speaking is I forget the term of it, but there's, there has to do with memory. So when I used to teach memory in my psychology classes, seven plus or minus two is the maximum number of digits or things that we humans can keep in our memory before we start having really significant losses. So seven or fewer is a good thing. Cause then it's a little bit easier for people to actually remember in their minds. Okay, that makes sense. So if you have nine, people go five, six, seven, eight, oh, duh. Right, so they <laughs> might get, they get a, little, a little bit more confused, which is, uh, I'm like banging my own head because I actually have nine things that I go over with my clients in my inner circle where we're leveraging our books to get yeah. these nine things. So whatever. But but I suppose it's, it's no different to, yeah, if you um, 
read something that said 101 ways to do such and such. Okay, it's, true, fa- true. it's far more than seven. You're not expected you're true. going to remember all 101 ways, but right, I suppose right. it determines how you're using it. So if you're using nine, well, that's in mm-hmm. your teaching method. So that basically applies. But for a basic article, I know I know three, yeah. five, and seven seem to be really, really common. Yeah, and then I, I would say to you, you know, we love I love talking about words and copy, but I think don't overlook the visuals that can go with it to assist. So in my nine things, yeah. I actually make them spell out the word supremacy and I have this crown with nine points on it and I okay. put the the letters supremacy all the way around on this crown so there's a bit more of a visual tie-in once you see what it's all about you kind of understand that but even the 101 ways once you get inside that they might be chunking the information they might say like here are 10 ways in marketing and here's a 10 ways in seo and 10 ways yeah. in in social media so then you can kind of your brain can kind of categorize the, th- the things a little bit easier so it helps but uh also with the post that we talked about earlier with the mystery part of the reason that my mystery posts work so well is in addition is I think not just the mystery, but also my visual made it a bit more enticing. So my visuals, my first post was just the general featured image of my podcast that always shows up. So I think people may be getting fatigued of seeing that. They're like, yeah. Oh, whatever. Another, yeah, another. podcast interview. whoop de doo yeah. <laughs> uh, on my mystery <laughs> one, it was this giant red block with white letters and it was spaced out. So it was like item one in white, item two in white, item three in white, but they were spaced out so you could scan it really easily. And I put a single emoji on each one that tied into what the word said. So one was like about being a podcaster or like the first podcaster to start something in the Southern hemisphere and I put a little mic. And then one was something about books and I put a little book. And then one was about money, so I put like a little dollar bag or something. So I tied in visuals that went with the words so that it was easier, again, to scan and process that information. Would you mind if I actually take one of those uh, graphics and put them in my show notes? So people can see an example of what it is that you actually did and then I'll just take it back to your website anyway. But that was my next question was, I actually wrote that down while you were talking, was the importance of maybe having infographics or graphics in Mm -hmm. your articles when you're writing, especially for for your website, you know, those type of things. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, you know, if it's a simple landing page or a squeeze page, if it's a Facebook ad, if it's a blog article, everywhere, make it more, make it easier for our brains to process by including a visually compelling photo that's relevant to what the writing is about and maybe ties in a little bit to the emotion too of what people are hoping to get. So for example, if you are, if your landing page or your article is about having success with writing, then maybe if you could find a picture of a person, a physical person holding a pen and like putting their arms in the air in like triumph, yeah. Woo-hoo. Then like people will say, oh, can you, can you I do the woohoo be... again for me? Do the woohoo again. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. So people, we, we connect with other people. There's something called mirror neurons that we have in our mind. So when we see other people doing something, it fires these mirror neurons and in our mind, it's, it behaves the same way as if we were doing it ourselves. So if we see other people happy, it literally makes us feel other happy inside too. So use that to your advantage with these visuals that are tied in with the emotions you want to evoke and the relevancy of whatever you're talking about. No, that's fantastic. So it's not just an infographic within the article itself. It's making sure you have a photograph that matches the article that you're writing and is that yeah, weird, why like, yeah. oh, do it all <laughs> and it's gonna be good photos too you can't just have a yeah you, know, you can't sometimes just take your own photo on your own phone which is a really crappy image sometimes and throw that up there you better to try and get a bit of quality yeah i mean i would say test it out and see what works because i think too we have been we get a little fatigued on those perfect oh, stock yeah. photo yeah. looking ones so maybe you could even scan through stock photos and get inspired by something and then with good lighting, you could replicate it yourself with a friend or your own or whatever. Um, I would say though, I somewhere on my desk, I've got a Canon T5i good digital camera. I never use the damn thing because yeah. my 
iPhone takes just as good as photos practically, and then it's on my phone and I can instantly post to Instagram or Facebook or wherever. I don't yeah, have to true. go through and transfer. So I would say if you've got a phone, go for it. You're good to go. The number one thing to improve your photos, though, is lighting. Yeah. Like, if it's bad lighting, I look like a hot mess. If it's good lighting, I'm like, whoo, I look good today. Good hair day. So <laughs> lighting is so important, even if you just, like, get all the lamps from your house and get some – well, lamps sometimes make you kind of like yellowed out. So see if you can get some natural light and some lights or lamps, light bulbs with white light coming out and just kind of light everything up, and it's going to make your photos a million times better. No, no, that's that's good advice. <laughs> and, yeah, I have, a, I have a, a really good digital camera, which I find is great – Mm. when I'm taking the photos. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I know, right? Then how are you in it? Oh, no. <laughs> but then I can't be in it. And then if I hand the camera to somebody else, for some reason, they never take the photos as well as what I take it myself. Where, But I must admit, your digital your smartphones these days are amazing yeah. what can they do, especially with video. I'm super impressed with the video yeah. these days. Yeah, and I really, you know, I believe done is better than perfect yeah. when it comes to photos, even when it comes to writing. I cannot tell you... I am a quote professional copywriter and like an author and a book coach and I still am revising my bio nonstop because there's always the more that you practice saying it in networking, the more you get feedback, the more you think about it, the more you refine and clarify what you're all about, you're allowed to go back and fix it. So don't feel like you need to just spend the next three months making it perfect before you share it. Put it out there. You can always edit it. Now, Everything can be edited. Are you on LinkedIn as well? Yes. Okay. What, what, what you're thinking on LinkedIn for um, dropping your articles on there? Yeah. You know, I'm just starting to do it a little bit more. I, I, my favorite spot is Facebook. That's where I'm the most active. Yeah. Personally, I have then my second runner up where I feel the most fun is Instagram. When I'm in LinkedIn, I'm kind of like, I don't really care. I don't know where to go. So <laughs> I don't personally use it that much, but I am trying to get a little bit better about sharing more content on there with link backs to my site just to get more people into the funnel, obviously, because it is a great place, especially for me. I mean, I really am business to business because I'm helping yeah. other entrepreneurs and coaches, consultants and, and people who are have businesses. So it's a place that I need to do a little bit better and be more active on. But um, I am starting to share more articles and I'll give a little hack. I have a ghostwriter that I hired yeah. and I have her now and she's doing it right now this month. She is going and taking an epic blog article I have on my website. So for example, I have this one blog and it's all about five steps to write your book. And inside, I've got 10 brainstorming ideas. So I said to her, okay, I want to reuse this, repurpose this content elsewhere without reinventing the wheel. So I hired her to go in and say, okay, pick like three brainstorming topics out of this blog. Yeah. So it's like 5% of the blog, 10% because it's really long. Rewrite it slightly. So it's the same content. You don't have to do any more research, but just kind of reword it so it's more unique. And now please go post it on LinkedIn. Go post it on Medium and say at the bottom, if you want to read even more ideas, here's the original full article and then link it back to my website. So I'm testing that out. I can't report results quite yet because it's brand, a brand new thing I'm just trying out this month. But I love the idea of repurposing things I've already invested time into creating uh, and kind of giving people a little taste on these platforms where I want to then bring them into the fold on my own website and I can pixel them with the Facebook pixel and do retargeting ads and all that fun stuff. So that's something that people could try too. Okay. No, I think that's great, great advice. Um, I did have, I had another question when you were talking sure. about that and then all of a sudden I drew this complete blank because I I was, when, you're actually, when you're actually talking about that idea, I'm going, yeah, that's a great idea and I could do that myself here. I'm supposed to stay focused yeah. on the conversation, but every now and no then worries. a guest will throw out a great idea and you go, bloody hell, that's a good idea. Well, I'm, I'm going to do that that's myself. That's a good sign that I'm like getting you to think. I love it. So hopefully the audience is feeling the same thing. <laughs> well, hopefully someone's just pulled over in their car and going, okay, I've got to write this down, LinkedIn article and yes. uh, and do that type of thing. And medium.com. And it was, oh, the film mm -hmm. is about medium. Um, so oh, yeah. you, you mentioned medium and I've seen that pop up recently in a few different places. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is Medium like LinkedIn where you can actually post your own articles or do you are you a selected author to be on Medium? Anyone can sign up for free and start publishing articles. So um, I it's did not, not know that. Yeah, it's just like a, a curated site for 
articles, but anyone can start their own account. So absolutely start it right now. It's free. Go for it. And, um, people can follow you. So when you post new stories, it'll, um, notify them. I think you also can link it up to your Twitter. So if you post an article on medium, it'll automatically share on your Twitter if you allow it. So I, I, you know, I haven't found like a huge rush. I haven't really given a lot of, um, time and energy, but I can say if anyone follows and listens to Gary Vaynerchuk, I, he's someone I really love. He talks about how medium can be great because if, one of the curators who works on Medium, if they find and like your article and they use it as a featured article, like on their homepage, you yeah. could get a ton of traffic. So it's like, huh, why not another place to repurpose and, and see what happens. If you're, so when you're repurposing and you've got, say, an article that's on your website where you, yeah, it's quite long, and then mm. you said you've got your ghostwriter who will then take three points, put it on LinkedIn, put it on Medium. Are they putting right. the exact same article on both or are they rewriting them slightly so they're not... Uh, exact copies of each other right I think this first round I had them just do a co- the same copy on both yeah my preference would be to rewrite both also but when it comes to pricing and time I was like you know what this first one let's just do it I don't think anyone's gonna like throw me in jail for having the same exact thing on no, both not, ones so not immediately anyway yeah no, <laughs> man, take him take him a while track me down yeah and I did mention that uh, you are tall so the the I, know, I do stand out in a crowd. You do stand yeah. out. So you're not going to be able to hide once I start chasing you. Um, <laughs> Laura, I have one last question for you. And this is a sure. question that I ask everybody uh, right at the end. So anyone that's listened to the show before will know what I'm going to ask. It's my Monday morning tip. And mm. it's, it's Monday morning. Someone's walking down the street. They see this really, really tall lady walking past. <laughs> and they're thinking, oh, the basketball team must be in town. Right. And then all of a sudden they realize, oh, no, you're that tall uh, writer. There's the, the podcast, Copy That Pops. Uh, you're Laura Peterson. I'm about to head into work. It's Monday morning. I'm going into work. What advice or tip would you give me when my butt hits that chair at 8.30 a.m., I turn my computer on and I sit there, what What should I do first? What should I do first? Good question. So I try to do this myself, so I try to take my own advice. You should first work on the top one to three ultimate priorities that if the end of the day came and went, you would be happy that you achieved. And you should do those before you open up Facebook, before you check your Instagram, before you let your text messages start pinging in your brain. You have to work on your most important things. Otherwise, other people's quote unquote emergencies will become your priorities and you'll never get to your true priorities. That comes with writing a book. So if you want to write a book, you should, I say, batch out some time in the early morning first thing before you let anyone else's emergency priorities take over your inbox and your your agenda if you have a job and you're trying to work on a side hustle then knock out those first few most important things that are going to move your business forward before you start saying yes to all the demands of your boss and in your customers (laughs) at your job Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase this question a little bit okay. more because I think when I threw in the word first, and the, oh. advice, you, the, advice, the advice you gave was great. Um, right, people but I are going to get a double dose of advice. Yeah, they're gonna, this is going to be a second one. So what writing tip would you give oh. me when I – Yeah, I know, that, was, that was my fault. That's not your fault because okay. as soon as I said what should you do first and you start answering, I'm going, that's great advice yeah. because that's what you should do first. But – I was thinking as a writer, because they've just bumped into you because you are this really tall oh, writer, yeah. what writing tip would you give me first thing Monday morning when I arrive at work? And is this for a book or any writing? Any writing. You can take hmm. as long as you want. I can edit out the pause. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. People can experience the pause. They can see I'm really thinking hard for them. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that came to my mind is more around books, but we can even apply it to any kind of writing. Yeah. So I would say... Whatever goal you have for the writing, let's say it's a blog or it's really awesome copy for a Facebook ad, it's for your book, whatever, you need to put a deadline on it of when it's going to be pushed out into the world. Okay. And this deadline, ideally, should be made public as much as possible because you're more likely to let yourself down in your own deadlines than if you have announced it to other people. You don't want to look like a a slacker or a fool in other people's eyes. So if it's a book, I, that's one of the first things I make my clients do is we are picking a date when it's going to be live on Amazon. So 
whether that's in 30 days, 90 days, whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, we can adjust that depending on your schedule and, and the timing, but you need to pick a date and we're going to write it down. We're going to stick it on a sticky note and we're going to start telling everyone on social media that is the date because you will find a way to get your butt in action and make it happen if you know other people are sitting there waiting for it. That is but perfect. this could also be for a blog or something too because we all love to make things perfect and yeah. let it take a year when it could have taken a week. So even like if you're going to write a great blog article, okay, start telling everyone my next blog is dropping on Friday. You heard it. Hold me to it. Friday it's coming out so that you feel motivated to get it done no matter what and not let other excuses come up and, and let that procrastination bug get you. No, that's fantastic. Can I ask you another question? Even though that sure. was my Monday morning tip and that's usually my last question, sure. but it was something you said that I thought, I'll get another question. Yeah. When you said it's going to be live on Amazon, when you when you wrote your book, mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. you have copies printed initially or did you purely just, you, what platform did you use to write your book and then actually right. get it onto Amazon or did you go through a publishing company? I didn't do a publication company. I did it all myself. I use Amazon. You create an account at kdp.amazon.com. KDP stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. I am a huge proponent. This is one of my core principles that I teach yeah. is to launch first with the Kindle version only Okay. for a lot of reasons. One, it'll help you hit bestseller easier because you can drop it down to 99 cents and that's an easy ask for people. Two, let's not give people 15 choices on Amazon. Let's give them one. So I don't want a Kindle and a print and a hard copy and an audiobook and all this stuff. I just want to give them one option when I'm doing my bestseller push. All I want you to do is go buy this Kindle. Please do it. You did it. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's it. Then the other thing is it doesn't stress you out as much. There are many things that we can do with our book, but let's do it one step at a time. Yep. So I say, start with the Kindle version first, do a bestseller launch around it, and then take a deep breath. You can even take a week or two off and not even look at the darn thing and then say, okay, whew, now let's get it into print. There are slight variations you need to do in the formatting of the file between Kindle and print. So now is the time we can, let's talk about that and get that all ready. And then we can upload that also to KDP or you can use something called createspace.com. Okay. KDP and CreateSpace are both Amazon companies and those let you do on-demand printing. So that means I do not print a bunch of stuff and throw them in my garage until people buy. Yeah. I let Amazon deal with all of that. So if you went and bought my printed book right now on Amazon, Amazon would process your credit card. They would ship it out to you. They would handle returns. They would ask you for a review. I don't have to do any of that. I just get a cut of the royalties afterwards. So yes. That's good. So even, even the book that you gave me, the copy, so you went and oh, ordered these mm -hmm. yourself. Yes. And I ordered just had them order them yourself, just had them delivered to you, and then you hand them yep. out that way. You didn't worry about Absolutely. having a hundred or two hundred printed, holding mm -hmm. them all in your office, and then dumping them out. That is a that is a great Ain't idea. Nobody got time for that. <laughs> my, yeah, so my I... daughter will love that comment. She impersonates that lady all the time, which is really funny. Um, I, know, I love that. That is fantastic. So, how can people get in touch with you again? Just give them one more. Yes. Give them, tell them one more time because I think people need to get in touch with you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate your your time and featuring me on the show. So, copythatpops.com is the central hub of everything. I've got podcast episodes you can listen to right there, epic blog articles, uh, free Facebook group you can find linked out from there. Uh, more information about my programs and services if you want to work with me even more in depth. And if you want to shoot me an email with a question or if you're just like, okay, you convinced me I want to work with you and I want more information, my email is simply laura at copythatpops.com. That is fantastic. Laura, thank you so much for coming thank on It's No Secret with Dr. T. And I'm so glad I walked into that room when you were doing the talk at uh, Podcast Movement and then... Jared, you happen to know Jared Warner happened to be uh, yeah. sitting at the front and I was looking for him anyway and then he in introduced me to you. So uh, this is fantastic and this is why, oh. this is this is the benefit of attending events live. I don't mm -hmm. care what anybody says, nothing beats a live event. You can, you can watch recordings afterwards but attending a live mm -hmm. event and meeting people is just oh, the sure. best way to go. So thank you for being on It's No Secret with Dr. T. Thank you for having me.
Well, that was absolutely awesome. I was so fired up after I spoke to Laura, and there's a couple of points that I just want to drive home again. And one of them was all those rules we were taught at school on how to write, just go and throw them out the window. It's all about writing compelling copy for the people who are actually going to be reading what it is that you write. Make your paragraph shorter, use bullets and dot points, and use numbers and visuals. The second thing I want to share, again, was if you're considering writing a book, write about something that will help you sell more of the products and services you already have. And it doesn't have to be your life story. Write something that gives value to people that are just a couple of steps behind you. And the other part I thought was really interesting, and this is the third point, that copy is just writing with a purpose for business. And when you are writing, just keep it in mind, when you're trying to take someone from step A to step B or point A, point B, and you want them to take action, just be mindful of the psychology of the reader. What is going through their mind when they're reading? And you have to make sure that your writing or what it is that you're writing, the copy, is compelling for them to actually take action. So who is my guest next week? Well, of course, I'm not going to tell you because I'm going to create a little bit of mystery, which I picked up from Laura Peterson. But what I will tell you is my guest next week started a company earlier this year, and I've been involved, I've been using their services from the time I started back in January. And I think in the next couple of years, this particular company, everyone's going to know who they are. So anyway, here's a little snippet of what's coming up next week. Sure. So an audiogram is usually it's a, a single image uh, like in its most basic form it's a single image with a moving waveform animation um, and it's a video file but it's it consists of uh, those two things um, with a podcast clip or a audio clip underneath so I think you you know most people I would imagine have probably seen similar things online on their Twitter feeds or on Instagram or Facebook, where you're, you know, you see a, a clip from uh, one of your favorite podcasts or radio shows, and it's just kind of like a, a simple way to get audio online and make it visually appealing. So I use audiograms a lot myself, and I think it's something that a lot of businesses, whether you're in podcasting or not, a lot of businesses can actually benefit from using an audiogram. I did one for my wife's shoe store. Uh, geez, a couple of months ago when I was doing a talk for using audio for your business. And we then put it on Facebook and it was amazing how well that particular video did. And I'll actually put a little link in the notes so that you can actually have a look at that uh, audiogram I did for my wife's shoe store. And it'll give you an idea of how you can actually use audiograms in your own business. So anyway, that's it for me this week. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Laura Peterson. I think she's absolutely amazing. And I'm inspired every time I talk to her. If you have any questions about this episode, please send me an email, tf at tysonfranklin.com. And remember, all my podcast episodes are on my website, tysonfranklin.com. Okay, that's it from me. And I will talk to you again next week. Bye for now.